This is the Pontiac 6000S uh, STE. Yeah, I had never heard of it either. And that's a lot of headlights. But in the 1980s, this Pontiac packed enough driving excitement to make car and driver's top 10 list for three straight years. In 1984, Road and Track named it one of its top 12 enthusiast cars. Boredom enthusiast, I'm guessing. No, I'm just kidding. I don't blame those publications for piling those honors on this car, because I'm sure they were well deserved. As this seemingly cobbled together sled of plastic pleather and pig iron was probably an impressive piece of engineering. For the era. But this is not going to be a video about the 6000 STE, because even if you could find one today, it probably wouldn't last three minutes in this traffic with the AC on. And I'm sure less than half of its original 135 scalding horsepower still live under the hood. The rest has gone the way of fried piston rings and driveline slop, equivalent to a fat guy meandering off the couch for more chips. Now, because of that, there's a phrase you hear over and over again anytime car and music people get together and start talking about days past. And that's that universal qualifier of for the era. For the era, the Pontiac 6000 had incredible performance. For the era, the Aston Martin Lagonda had futuristic styling. For the era, the trade-off of 9 miles to the gallon for 350 horsepower wasn't too bad. Yeah, and Molly Crew got away with writing a song that literally just name-dropped a bunch of strip clubs. And it was a masterpiece. For the era. But let's talk about a car that doesn't need that qualifier. And let's talk about a band whose era still lives on today, nearly 40 years after they helped create it. Because every once in a while, things do come along that are just plain good. No excuses, no qualifiers, no for the era, but just flat out good. You'll see what I'm talking about. crisis of confidence. This is former President Jimmy Carter's 1979 Crisis of Confidence speech, otherwise known as the Malay speech. It covered, among other things, America's need to free itself from a crippling dependence on foreign oil. Now, even though Carter never actually said the word Malays that night, many, many years later, car people began to use the phrase Malays era to describe the decade that framed that speech, from about 1973 to 1983 or seven Bowie changes, if that's how you're trying to pass the time. Long live Bowie. Now, anyway, you can go online and find a lot of eloquent, loquacious discourse on the Malays era. Or I can save you the time and just spill the beans right now. It sucked. It was a time when gas was short, disco was hot, war was cold. And all the cars seemed to look like this. Wait, go back to that previous one? Because obviously one of these cars is not like the others. And that might be because while America's big three car companies basically sleptwalked through the Malays era, answering every exterior question with, what about more brown? And every interior question with, what about more velour? 
Way across the pond, BMW is thinking, uh, weißt du, da wir ein wirklich gutes Autounternehmen und alle sind, was ist, wenn wir eine unglaublich nicht außerhändige Auto mit einem schönen Interior und großer Leistung und futuristisch der Features gemacht? Glauben Sie, dass die Leute es wollen? Ja, ich denke schön. So, like, say, the story of the Rose, the group from Concrete. The BMW 6 Series came ashore in the late 1970s to break through a sea of American automotive despair. Long live Polygram Tupac. Hey, like the Rose, the, what? Hologram Tupac, what is he talking about? No anyway, something else turned up on American shores in the late 1970s and as curious and European as the 6 Series must have looked next to your standard Malaysia era hoopty. The Cure 2 must have sounded equally obtuse next to any of the mainstream Macs of the era. I mean, they weren't really punk and they weren't really rock, two things that Americans would have recognized. Their sound was foreign, but still pretty accessible. It was catchy, it was melodic, but not easily definable. It was, well, it was this. It was Boys Don't Cry, and even though it wasn't the goth sound that The Cure would forever become known for, it turned out that even on their first record, The Cure were already up to one of their greatest tricks, and that's disguising a plaintive sad song as a happy little pop tune. There was no disguising what the 6 Series was though, even if, just like with The Cure, America really didn't know what that something actually was. And what it was, of course, is a GT car. A car designed to eat miles with comfort and performance. A car designed to involve the driver, but also make the passengers actually happy they were along for the ride. Something that a regular sports car didn't always do. And the irony, of course, is that for a country that prided itself on taking on the open road, America's car manufacturers never really gave a second thought to making a good GT car. So when the 6 Series showed up, with seating for four, plenty of horsepower to throw at the wheels, a confident and comfortable ride, and a damn refrigerator in the back, America looked at it the same way they looked at the Cure and said, I don't know what this is, but I know that I like it. And what's not to like? Because even if the motoring purpose of the 6 Series was still a rather new idea to the American driver, it wasn't like BMW had taken a big shot in the dark on the car. Because this lineage could be traced directly back to the incredible cars that Munich had been putting out from the 60s all the way up to the mid 70s. To the point where, in all honesty, it would have been harder for BMW to screw up the 6 Series than it was for them to make it as great as they did, considering the formula they already had to work with. Take the already great 30 CSI, we'll warm it over a little bit, call it the 633 CSI, and clock out. When this is the starting point you have from which to build a new car with, for God's sakes, all you gotta do is just not get in your own way, and you'll be fine. And in 1985, with their album The Head on the Door, the Cure had taken their own signature formula and warmed it over. Literally. Because the cold goth of previous albums had now given way to a poppier, more approachable sound. A sound, though, that still carried with it the signature trait that weaves all their albums together. And that's layers. Layers. Layers of unique parts played on top of each other. Point, counterpoint. Layers of melody and dissonance that create this beautiful tension and release. Or it could be as simple as pan claps on a drum beater. Counterpoint melodies vying for your attention. Or a bass line that creates the perfect pocket for other instruments to fit in. Or, in the case of 1985's Close to Me, all that. Within like the first 60 seconds.
You know, a funny thing happens when you start writing songs that are catchier than the flu, like Close to Me, and that's that you find yourself with a bona fide hit record, which is exactly what The Cure had now with the head on the door. And though they didn't necessarily need a hit to justify the cult-like following they were already building, it certainly didn't hurt. Because here you had a band that went from being quite happily established as this marginalized niche goth act to suddenly being the face of an entire movement. I mean, MTV loved them, the radio loved them, and most importantly, the youth loved them. And those Young Cure fans, they didn't just like the band, but literally cloaked themselves in the very essence and molecular makeup of the music to the point where it became their identity. I mean, the Cure was the soundtrack to their lives. They felt like the Cure belonged to them. These were fans that were like, yeah, I listen to the Cure every now and then. These are fans that had tapestry-sized posters of Robert Smith over their bed so he could watch over them as they slept. BMW fans knew a lot about posters too at this point because, oh yes, Bavarian Motor Works had its own cult that was very much in full stride in America by the mid-1980s. And they built that cult the same way The Cure did, with something new that the youth loved. The yuppie, the Reagan set, the young professional fresh out of college with their Wall Street job. They didn't want the same cars their parents had. They didn't want no lumbering Cadillac or an old stodgy Mercedes. They wanted this. They wanted a BMW. Or maybe a Porsche, but they'd have to wait for their stocks to split to get that. No, they wanted a 635. They wanted a nimble little 3 Series. And once they had one, there was no going back. No one drives a 635 CSI in 1985 and says, you know what, it's good. But I think I'd still rather have that rear wheel drive waterbed they had back at the Cadillac dealership. So, they both had their fervent fan base, they both were the best at what they did, and they were both icons now of their era. But, like we talked about at the very beginning, we're here to talk about things that transcend era. Things that don't get anchored to a time period to temper their praise. And by the time the 1980s were done and dusted, the 6 Series and The Cure had become those transcendent things. And though it took a decade for them to reach their final form, when they did, America saw that it was very, very good. Because in 1989, The Cure released this, Disintegration. Which, yes, commercially was their biggest album. But more importantly, it bottled every drop of the goth and angst and despair that the band had ever been known, and then briefly not known, for, and dropped it on the world like a bomb. Because even the most diehard Cure fan who thought they knew exactly what was coming, was blown clean out of their Doc Martens the first time they heard a song like Lullaby. And at the same time, just towards the end of the 80s, BMW released this, the 24 M6. It was a body of a 6 Series with the engine from a race car in it, and if I need to describe it any further than that for you to actually want it, then you're watching the wrong video. Now, BMW only brought about 1,700 M6s over to North America, which actually makes them more rare than the Porsche 930 Turbo we talked about in the last video. So needless to say, I don't have one. But rest assured, they are incredible machines and very desirable, and no car person has ever seen one in person without immediately wanting it.
So, take your pick. The Pontiac 6000 STE, a car that won more awards in the 80s than Meryl Streep, or the BMW 6 Series. All it could manage to do was represent a premier car company at peak form. All it could manage to do was help build the M Performance division into what it's become today. And all it could manage to do was be so good that BMW brought it back in 2003. Whereas, hold on, let me just see what Pontiac's up to. Oh yeah, they went out of business six years ago. Maybe they should have brought back the 6000 STE as well. You know, with all those awards it won. This is the Frank Irwin Center in Austin, Texas. It seats about 18,000 people for concerts. And 18,000 people is exactly who showed up here to see The Cure play a sold out show in May. That's 18,000 people to see a band that formed nearly 40 years ago. Just to put that into perspective, Duran Duran, a well-known 80s contemporary of The Cure's, will be playing the Tobin Center for two nights in San Antonio later this year, to the tune of 800 people each night. That's a lot less, but it's directly in proportion to how much bigger The Cure is in terms of influence and popularity and sheer fanaticism of their fanatics. Yes, The Cure put out more albums after disintegration. Yes, they had some pretty good songs well into the 90s, but let's be honest here, they didn't need to if they didn't want to. Because this place still would have sold out even if The Cure called it quits immediately after the last notes of disintegration rang out and they never wrote another song. Because just like the 6 series, the 80s is all The Cure needed to solidify themselves as one of the greatest, not of an era, but really of all time.